There's space for activism for the humanists who is interested in science and who would like to link it to human rights and who is able to promote skepticism. But we thought an important objective for this workshop would be the agreement in principle to continue our networking and take things forward. Um, take for example, people who perform ceremonies within the humanist movement. There's a network, there's an exchange of ideas, of resources, and so on. Uh, if you know of humanists or counselors, then they have a network. They have a possibility of learning from each other. There is no such institutional possibility within the IHU framework as of now. Uh, but we would like to promote that. That's the first thing. The second is, you see the ILCAF, the uh, International Committee of Liaison for Free Thinkers. Now, why did they feel the need to establish something like that? It's because they see no possibility for free thinkers, rationalist activists, to find a way of expressing their interest in that aspect of humanism within the traditional humanist meetings. So there was a need which was not being addressed. Um, I think a more pressing requirement, not just me, is a requirement to do something about science and the great challenges science is having to face. At all levels, as you've seen, there are people who value numbers and attribute powers to them. There are people who go about saying they can kill someone by thought. There are areas where you're grappling with the latest in biotechnology, about uh, social norms that are changing um, because of the influence of science. So there's a wide range of issues that humanists could be associated in, if that is of their interest. Secondly, I think activists, your Ikwe, for example, who have been exposed to extreme danger, now, I mentioned Leo and not uh, Professor Naik, because they beat him up and they didn't do that to him yet. Because he's attained a profile in society where to touch him is not easy. Whereas Leo Igwe, who has not established his image as somebody very senior in society, so to say, is exposed to danger. Sometimes that is addressed by an award which is international, sometimes that is addressed by <coughs> such persons the opportunity to do something more serious at a larger scale. So many things are possible. But the intention is to strengthen uh, the work and the image of such people who are into dangerous work. Uh, not to say that Scientology uh, work is not dangerous, it is, it can. They have the money to engage lawyers that can ruin you financially. Uh, the one in uh, Australia who was working against creationism. I, at this moment I forget his name, the uh, geology professor, who was made bankrupt because of uh, the attacks made against him. There must be some kind of um, active network. Uh, if you say, well, the skeptic network in Norway was uh, dormant for 15 years and we had to revive it. It shows how much the skeptic movement is being neglected. And its connection with the mainstream humanist work. That's work which is tricks and magic and prestidigitation. That state shows. Uh, therefore, it's not of the dignity that my academic work will, will require. It's not mainstream. I think that idea should go. Because as you've seen today, the problems of science and superstition are the problems of life and death. I threw some statistics at you. Tens of millions of people being displaced from their homes because someone has accused them of being a witch. The fact that the magical concept of the universe is still very, very dominant in society is the cause for this. As long as that is there, humanism cannot flourish either. Uh, so they are intimately linked. Now, what I'm hoping we would do is find out how many here would like to be part of such a network of keeping in touch, of within a humanist IHU framework, create an active lobby of skeptics, rationalists, and science popularizers so that we lead that into global action.
about five years ago, we took up the issue of untouchability. And patiently, we built a network <coughs> amongst the humanists. Because not every humanist might be interested in that aspect. And now we are close to launching uh, with, uh, with V.V. Rawat as this, at the center of the network, a global alliance against untouchability. That includes activists from 13 different countries where untouchability is and useful. Just projecting a model that worked. Um, I think it's time we do something about this. It's a small group, but most likely, I would say, half of this group is committed or has as much experience as some of the speakers. So it's not as if uh, the audience is not without power. We can bring that together. Um, perhaps uh, Bob can give us some ideas on how to get the media to help with spreading some ideas. Uh, it is important. We are doing an adult education program when we read science uh, on television or through the media. With that intro, I throw it open to suggestions, volunteers, objections, or any nuances you want to add. But I'm hoping we will say we, will, we have the seed of a network which we will work on and build with uh, on email and other uh, means, and have specialist meetings of those who are engaged in work of this kind. That for me is very important. <coughs> and how we can include educators in all this, people who have been working at school, expose the child at school age to all these. And the child is immune to the nonsense that comes up with it. I can tell you with a little bit of parental pride. When my son was taken to, he was three, he was taken to a neighbor's religious ritual. After three minutes, he said to his mom, we don't believe in all this, let's go home. <laughs> now, it might be just a child's reaction because he wanted to watch TV rather than be there. But once a child is given the opportunity to think, these dangers are not there. And how to get that as part of school curriculum is the major challenge of four days. And we'll write the list out. And if you will please leave your email addresses, I'll get back to you with information on that. I circulate a pad where you could write your name and email address. And if that's OK, a phone number, at least we can reach you. I want to be able to say in two years' time from now <coughs> that we have an active global network of rationalist skeptics, atheists within the IHU framework, whose resources we can draw on. If very often, Professor Kubakin, in discussions on TV in India, they keep saying some Russians have proved that Kirlo, uh, um, Kirlian photography works well. Some <coughs> Russian has shown. I would like to be able to, from a TV channel, make a call to you and say, please say something to this fellow who is talking about Russia. This can have tremendous impact, I can tell you. People watch this and then they're zapped that you have a resource that can reach out to um, any part of the world. I hope we can do that. Um, kindly fill in your name, phone number if possible, and an email definitely. Um, thanks for the invitation to talk about uh, just about journalism and journalists and the media. Yeah, I mean, during this congress, we've heard different views of the media, um, very skeptical views, and uh, but some positive views. And I think you certainly have positive views of what the media can do and what uh, how the media can help. And I think it's very important to remember that um, the media is not all one. Uh, there are different types of media and different types of newspapers. I. I I uh, sometimes get very angry when people tell me that the media distorts everything. Well, um, I say, well, which media are you talking about? Um, well, the media in general. It's, uh, we don't. Um, I, as I said earlier, I work, work all my, my life for Reuters, and I, I don't think um, uh, that's a very specific sort of organization. We, we, we find it difficult to, to preach or to put over points of view, uh, except if there are other people's points of view. Uh, that you are reporting. And I think um, one would find that the general public is very interested in the sort of thing we've seen on the screen there. I know our, our bureau in Delhi um, reported quite extensively on the unmasking of um, the, the chap, um, I think, well, I can't remember, it was you who did it, 
um, on television um, who um, was wanted to, uh, said he could kill you. And oh, that was someone else. That was someone else. There was, there was a, yes. But um, you, you have to choose the choose your media, the, choose your journalist. Uh, but uh, certainly, I, I think there is one problem, Bob. If I may say that, mm. it should never be the strength of ours to go and defeat an idiot who needs mental help uh, and say this is a victory of rationalism. I don't think so. I mean, if someone's saying to you, "I can kill you by my thoughts." I, I would pity that uh, you are exposing that person because he actually needs help. Uh, I don't want to win over sick people. No. Uh, but there are tendencies. I mean, you have a fight with a homeopath or an acupuncturist. You are bringing information into the debate, into the discussion. I would, I would be happier dealing with concrete things like that. There are, there's a mad fellow. I, I, I was called to go and talk to somebody on television. This chap claimed to get energy from the sun. Um, and I was asked to go and discuss the, uh, the whole thing with him. I refused. I said, is he a bloody plant or what? <laughs> he just needs help. Um, in the US, there was a big fuss made about this very rich radio network guy. Coming, or I forget his name. The one who said on the 13th of May, the world would end, or something like that. Now, come. That, that guy needs help. Uh, but because he's powerful, we must do something to counter it. So I'm, I think maybe strategy is also important. I agree, but uh, equally, I think the, the, the fact of seeing um, one of your colleagues on television disproving uh, the claims from the, this, this sort of person uh, has an effect. It does, it's not necessarily to ridicule him but simply to show um, just how much charlatanry uh, there is around and that, um, to give, implant the idea in people's heads that you should be skeptical about these uh, things. Uh, if, I, if I could add something, there are some media, not Reuters, who are more interested in a sensational oh, yes. story yeah. than getting at the truth, but you can give them a sensational story. You have to find a way of presenting and these things are, are sensational, and they're human stories that appeal to human emotions. So I think the way you're doing it in the real world is as stories, as not as cold hard fact, you know, not didactically, but actually showing people and interesting them and engaging them. You just do the same with media as a natural. I can confirm that because um, when there was a victim of a <coughs> accusation. We went and spoke to the widow. We took the media to meet the widow. We showed how much it desensitizes, how much it dehumanizes the superstition. And people watch because it's a human story. And then there is a chance to say something. Absolutely. This might be part of the strategy for when we plan a campaign. Manta, um, you're scratching your head. Yeah, I wanted to add, add a little point on like what your request on having people connected and getting this uh, promoting scientific inquiry forward. I think especially with the, uh, the internet-based communications, Facebook groups and other uh, like video events that gets transmitted, it's very easy to interlink all the different geographical locations and have whenever you, there is an event, it can get, if, if we, we link into a web, it's very easy. When we have an event in Scotland, it, 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 it will be available in Bangladesh. Like it, it, and I think that's really important that just to highlight the one small thing about you know, what, what we have done. In a, in a country where only 10% of the people have internet access, we have had more than 25,000 uh, visits to a site that, that carried regular press releases and updates and articles. And I think it, it doesn't have to be limited to a one particular geographic area because when you are on the internet, it just goes like no no boundaries. So I think it's, it's really important that people get together and share their events with other groups and have a, like a like our own intranet, global intranet, to to communicate. So uh, one other point, if I may add, there is it's important to 
decide which language we want to conduct our activism in. Um, in large parts of the world, English is not the language to conduct a mass campaign in. Uh, you want to reach out to people, it will have to be necessary uh, the local language. Anders, you want to ask? Uh, yes, um, I'm glad you said intranet at the end, uh, because if we are to communicate to one another and, and sort of discuss strategies in, in ways, you know, it may not always be helpful that it's in a public forum. Yeah, absolutely. I, that's, we, find our own we have forum to have. The access, the, the, all those tools don't really cost anything. That they are done by multi-billion dollar companies. They have done it and it's available for free, especially for groups like this, Google, Google, companies like Google support. For example, our group has like you know certain privileges that other accounts don't have. And when you, all you have to do is ask companies like Google and they set it up for you, so. Maybe that uh, Betty, don't go away without telling us what you want to do in Uganda. Yeah, I think uh, that's very important because I didn't like... We, we <laughs> haven't put on a show. We haven't put on a show. We've yeah. organized a grouping of people so we can discuss what we can do. Because it's important for the organization which are working, they have to express their solidarity. That's the first thing. Because it cannot go with internet uh, working just. Because internet, we just share the information. But I think it's like uh, what you said. At the one side, when the international people express solidarity with us, or any information that we are sharing, it, it, it gives a great boosting. The, the media is also under tremendous pressure, the, the so-called mainstream media, because the, the social media has taken over actually at this moment. I can tell you that in recent, recent years, the campaign that succeeded in India, including even at this moment campaign against one film in India, which was actually wrong or right both sides. But that was totally on the on the uh, Twitter and Facebook. A lot of information, a lot of sharing of ideas. And when, when you are working at the ground, where we have to uh, select our language, uh, most of the people who are victim actually, and who suffer. So that information, if we uh, go through the local language dailies, we get a lot of information. And it's we share at this uh, network, and that network, if there are some good stories, can press. There are a lot of international interest, actually. And if a story comes in Guardian, that makes a lot of impact on our, actually, uh, policy makers. And that makes pressure on our local media also. Many times, the, the TV channels actually cite if somebody in, uh, abroad actually appreciate our so-called culture. We from India are exporting the spiritual, spiritual Indian spiritualism abroad. And that has actually, uh, last time I was called by Star News and they said, oh, Stephen Hawkins has said something. So Stephen Hawkins saying something, our media picks up and then they, they invite a few other people and then this discussion goes on. And if a person abroad appreciate any superstitious thing, they give, in, uh, they give like, as uh, TN Session was saying, I am uh, from Harvard, I am appreciating and I support Sai Baba. So this kind of thing, if we have people from abroad and we can give the, the names, addresses, the stories, campaign, it makes a lot of difference. And I think, you know, both information at the grassroots level in our country and the international campaign, like against homeopathy. Homeopathic uh, medicine just psychologically. So they don't believe that it is not medicine. It is declared not a medical treatment. But they need some something from like uh, what they call civilized world and that is a tragedy. But it, it, it is a really mix of information from the Europe, America and our country and share these ideas. I think it gives a boost to campaign. Thank you. Uh, one thing is that we about what you're doing, Margaret. You, you, you connecting the, the politicians and the key figures was that was important, making, making it embarrassing to be connected to these roles as so important you, because they are uh, they are slaves to popularities. So they'll do whatever they can get the attention and be positive. If that's going with the crazy guys, they will do that. The moment you switch that, it becomes an embarrassment. But they will stop doing it, even if they believe it. They will lie about believing it. That's really, really important. 
That's the kudos to you for that. Thank you. I, I think we should, um, from the comments, we should see there is some ideas about strategies to be adopted. That we should involve people beyond the movement, especially those who have an influence on society and possibly a power as well. Uh, I, I was wondering, uh, the uh, capacity for reason is mentioned in the UN Declaration on Human Rights. Uh, organized and active subversion of, uh, of your capacity for reasoning, or your capacity for reasoning, uh, could that be regarded as sort of infringing upon uh, that declaration? Uh, yes, but it's not just a civil. You can say yes, it, uh, it offends the, uh, the values enshrined, so to say, in the declaration, but you have no redress that. You can do nothing about it except protest. Um, and I think all uh, constitutions recognize, almost all of them, uh, that we are, these are constitutions for the modern society and so on. Yeah, but it's, 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 a, it's a different thing whether or not you dress it up as a human rights issue. It, it is against it, but we can do nothing about it. That's what you can't go to the police saying it's against Article 1, um, for example. You can make a speech about it, but people have not heard about Article 1 of the UDHR. Uh, so there are... Um, no, but then you're very specific about India or something. Not necessarily. Um, what I'm saying is we can't argue from a legal document to a person who doesn't even know the most basics of things. When we are arguing, we are talking about helping people who are completely helpless and the tyranny of superstition. Yes. So the thing is, uh, we, we acknowledge uh, the human capacity of reasoning. Uh, and uh, we have the right to uh, receive information okay, and education and all these things. So then it becomes our obligation to make sure that uh, we have the right information, we have the right education, we have the right things. Because uh, uh, the other guys have also the right to give their information. Right? So I don't really think it's... Uh, if, if I understand you correctly, uh, I think it's not relevant. Okay? So we, so we have to finish in 10 minutes. The crucial thing is do we have the names of people who are interested and the means to contact them as well. That would be the most important. Yeah. After watching all this, I'm more annoyed than I'm because of some reasons I don't get. But I wonder if we can be given a copyright to law. It's like that when I go to Uganda, I feel like putting this on a certain prominent TV show so that I, I uh, the Ugandans can uh, actually watch what is going on because uh, there are very many victims of some circumstances in Uganda. But I wonder if we can be given permission by the professor to explain to the Ugandans what is going on all over the world because the Ugandans have got I'm going to very poor in college if we put something in the newspaper and we have to forward and uh, have access to it, but I just think I want some of that. Is. So I uh, wonder if you can give them permission to talk about some of such issues. Uh, I, I think it really making available information is a crucial thing. That could be shared via website, blogs, whatever. That, that could emerge out of discussion and interaction for sure. I think, um, for example, he was talking about Skeptoid um, and the uh, Dalai Lama related thing that we were not aware of. Um, only what resources can definitely help. Have you, have you tried in, in India to, to, to follow up people who have been claimed being saved or whatever, they, or it, like after a year or two years, to take them back to media and say, this is what not yes. in a systematic way, but they have been. Um, we always follow. Yeah. We have been following up the Sai Baba for 35 years. Ah, yes. Yes. It's more than Sai Baba. Is Sai Baba dead now? He yes. yes. died last month, two months back. Well, while he was living, he was called the living God. I don't know what you no, call him now. He's called the dead God. <laughs> 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 
This is the thing of saying I will die on this day, I shall be reborn there. It's, uh, <coughs> yeah, yeah, some suggestions. Uh, first of all, I can see the scientific community, academic community, educational community in every country uh, as a body which is responsible for a uh, uh, struggle against uh, uh, ignorance, including all this stuff. So the, our work is also, also should, should include the appeal to the scientific educational community to be more responsible. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, uh, scientific community, educational community, uh, has to make the new social contract with government and business and mass media. Educational community, scientific community should be the uh, full power partner between mass media, uh, business, and government. Because we have to defend reason. We have to defend democracy. We have to defend uh, uh, science as a manifestation of reason. So all these tasks uh, are interconnected. interconnected. So uh, I think our job should be also to appeal to the scientific community. Most scholars do not like to do this job we are discussing here. Because they consider this as something secondary, so, second sort job. It's not a job, it's I, I, I'm a scholar. It's not correct. Because they can lose the position. Science was invented about 500 years ago. But no guarantee that science will uh, <laughs> live in the future, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's not, we, we have no any guarantee in anything serious in life. We have to struggle for everything. So that's my idea. Professionally, I belong to the same community. Yeah. I'm a biochemist by profession. Yeah, me too, I'm but to my colleague considers me as a, as a white bird, means strange person. <laughs> but I, I think it's very important, and the reason why we are talking about this is because the culture of science is not well established in our societies. And a large part of that task falls on non-scientists because the scientists are not so interested in defending the values of their own profession. Um, of course, in countries like India, the scientist has no schizophrenia between the prayers and the predictions and <coughs> the threats around their risks to influence their future and the satellite that they can send to the moon. There's no contradiction in their mind. That's, um, that's bad. Yeah, that's a terrible situation. Uh, they have even delayed the launch of a failed satellite because the time was not auspicious. It still didn't fly. Um, right, perhaps we should, because we're going to be locked out of the room, yes. uh, perhaps we should thank all our speakers for being here. Um, we will keep in touch. I think we have the contact.